Fantastic to have you back for ThinkTech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture. This happening to be our 286th show. And thanks to Eric with us uh, the last time until he returns. Our producer, you see which accumulated viewer you are down there. You just saw it. Here it is. So thank you for that. And we are in the 13th volume of trying to find out why in the world are we getting our most recent high rises from the fellow windy city of Chicago, uh, both architectural authoring wise and anatomy sort of uh, bone and skin wise. We're wondering about that. And we is both of us around our not active volcano of diamond head in honolulu hawaii the soto brown actually had moved to his office further down past that other volcano and uh, is in the bishop museum and i'm in the waikiki grand so I'll see you in a sec for that so if we can get the first slide up so let's share that with the audience because I'm, as promised, we bring us back to skinny towers here. This is one in Chicago from a time that is uh, makes you makes your childhood sick, uh, in a in a good way. Homesick is kind yeah, of yeah, yeah. English word, right? Because that's from that from that era, from the early '60s when you were a little kid, and they we're excited to see all these things popping up around you. And actually, that neighborhood of the Gold Coast was actually even before where I'm sitting in in Waikiki, right? Yeah, it was, uh, that was an early, uh, well, it was kind of a warning if we, if we want to go that far as to say that there were plans to build a lot more high rises around and obscuring the view of Diamond Head. And the first clump that got started was the one at, which we now refer to as the Gold Coast. And fortunately, zoning laws were changed in the 1960s to prohibit more high rises that might cover up Diamond Head, even though there were developers who said, oh, that doesn't make any difference. We don't care about that. Fortunately, that didn't happen. But what we did end up with is a cluster of mid-century buildings, uh, some of which are quite distinctive on the Gold Coast at the base of Diamond Head. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why it gets a separate little essay in the book we're supposed to write. That's right. With Don Hibbert and Bill Chapman, which you see the cover up there, having the same color that they gave us that is matching where we have low tide. And That's our right. ocean looks like that as we see there. And yes, you're right. While urbanistically maybe questionable, but architecturally, yes, this these were the heydays of easy breezy. And we have a great sort of a, a chain of pearls from Ossipov, your architect of your childhood, a little further away, your home there. And we have Takashi Anbi, we have Alfred Yee, even as an architect, we have, you know, uh, Johnson and Perkins and you, the early Joe Paul Rongstead, you name them all, you have them all there. So it's, it's actually great. There's also Gold Coast all over the world. Uh, we both remember our former colleague, uh, Magi Sagimaka from Finland, who is now in Australia. She teaches at a place that it's called the Gold Coast. So this one here is the Gold Coast in Chicago. It's sort of up, meaning north, uh, the lake, Lake Michigan. And um, it's uh, different than the neighborhood. I mean, there's some cute little funky little, you know, little Smurf houses there in your goal, in our Gold Coast. They're there historic, right? But uh, and so we have the same nature of, of this here, where there are these sort of Victorian townhouses that you see at the very bottom right. This is how it looked for uh, when this neighborhood was built. And then uh, these uh, high rises were, were coming again in mid-century. And, and again, um, I watched last night with one eye, I watched this weird movie from 82. I don't know if you had a chance to check your emails. I sent it to you. Um, what's it called? It's kind of a weirdo from a kind of a, 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 a kind of a humorous uh, movie with these two guys and it starts out anyways, I'm blanking on the name, um, uh, um, but uh, it's, uh, it starts out in Chicago and it's like they say, it's like, oh, we, we have the, the coldest day, wind chill, like minus 80 or something, they're exaggerating, although sometimes it is like that. So in, in all fairness, uh, this is uh, image uh, material that we try to uh, recruit from our own uh, best we can. And this is all from uh, about 2010 when I left the neighboring prairie 
uh, and go to the desert for two years of Arizona. And I took the emerging generation there and I made them walk. Uh, me and European, I am, through, as you can see, this white stuff at the top right there. And they were wondering, what is going on? Where is he taking us? And, you know, while these architectural tour guides um, are, are good to, um, you know, go somewhere and then you, you, you know upfront who the architect is, but sometimes it's, it's interesting also to just venture out to like a scavenger hunt and not know what happens. And uh, in all honesty, um, you know, what uh, at, at like for a few months in the year, we match climate wise uh, because there's summers. And when there's summer here, as you can figure, when these leaves are back on these trees and you walk through, it's very pleasant, it's very shaded. And then uh, you don't see any high rise because the canopies of the tree kind of camouflage that, right? And you also don't see this building because the building only starts around near where the treetops are because there is no building, but just these very skinny filigree spaghetti-like columns. And I tell you, I have to tell you because I couldn't find a picture, uh, they have these crazy cracks that you're wondering, how in the world is this building holding up, you know, or you're wondering if, if it's going to come down, right? You're also wondering, you know, about, we talked about in the last show about, you know, um, how did they keep the building when it becomes a building up there warm? They have to insulate it from below, right? And these columns, as you can tell, they kind of become half you know, circles when it becomes a building and then it's, it's an exoskeleton because half of that is still outside, right? So we actually want to encourage the audience to look above and beyond what they see, but also imagine the other sense is how do you feel in a building and how does a building feel itself in these harsh kind of changing climates, right? That's what this building is all about and what we were wondering and then um, I guess we start to say who the architect was, and I start to say he was a disciple of the famous Mies van der Rohe, who built his famous Lakeshore Drive apartments, which are all still skeletons, versus this is a concrete building, as you can tell, because there's no way you can make these columns steel and then insulate them, you know, then there would be even more skinnier. That doesn't work. So this is concrete here. And uh, so his name is Bertrand Goldberg, and he was a disciple of Mies. And you might say, oh, no wonder, because this looks like the boxy, uh, you know, um, Lakeshore Drive apartments. But when you do more research, which you want to encourage to everyone do, we're just basically kicking people off here to go above and beyond where we go. If you do your little researching and reading here, you find out that not only this crazy, you know, having left the building open at the bottom is a cause of zoning. They basically made Goldberg do that. And he took advantage of it and said, okay, then I'm going to add the stories that otherwise would be at the bottom, not so attractive. I add them to the top. And also he wanted to do, because he was actually the rebel kid. He was the black sheep in the, in the, in the Miesian family, because while Mies was doing predominantly everything squarey and boxy, um, Goldberg was rebelling that and saying, I'm going to do everything organic and, and curvy, linear and round. And so uh, here he couldn't do it because zoning didn't allow him to do that. And so also he did something different from our point of view and saying, how does the building feel with all the senses? Because we said, and we can go to the next slide for that reason already, because we could say if Mies was a, was a sustainable architect in some way, somewhere there, we found out that Lakeshore Drive Apartments actually have uh, the, the supply of daily goods at the base. There's a, there is a convenience store there, which, by the way, my Waikiki Grand had as well in the very beginning. Now, unfortunately, it's a, it's a realtor's office. Bummer, right? Which we don't need on a daily basis, but food we need on a daily basis. But then uh, uh, Goldberg was doing something above and beyond his master in actually keeping the building cool over the hot summers there, which are sometimes hotter than us. And we're reading here that the building, uh, which is structurally also innovative, because you see at the bottom right that historic picture there, they first built the core. And then in a slip form, they, they went up and basically did the, did the floors with the parameter columns that was pretty innovative for its time and something was very innovative that we see only in the text there and we can imagine at the image and that gets us to the next slide 
And these are louvers that were <laughs> adjustable. Doesn't that get us excited as well as it another does. part of the project because it had a restaurant that had a fancy name of a French restaurant. And what do these, do these two things remind us of here? One of our favorites. <laughs> they remind us of the Ala Moana building because the Ala Moana building originally had vertical louvers on the exterior. And you can see a picture of that at the top left. And then it also had a famous rotating round restaurant on the top, which was called La Ronde. So it was French in name, just as the Maxime de Paris French name was used. And I just want to say, too, uh, in reference to the exterior of the building, the base with those soaring columns reminds me very much of the Killingsworth buildings that we are very fond of here in Honolulu, the the um, Kahala Hilton Hotel and the Seaside, not the Seaside, but the Seashore Hotel in Waikiki, as well as very much the Kahala Apartments. So they visually look like this building at the base does. Absolutely. And me going through on a daily basis also runs Halikulani at the uh, entrance. You know, you see what Ron calls Hi Ron, who is originally from that part of America, from the United States. Um, and so, uh, which he calls structural expressionism, you're right on. That's, you see what holds the building up and it's not faked, right? It's there, it's the real deal. And uh, it attracted, it became quite famous and popular. This is why we threw in Elvis Presley here as one of the people in La Ronde up there. And Maxime's, you can read, it attracted the Beatles. And I think... Um, uh, who was the other guy, uh, one other famous musician um, who was basically also all uh, basically dining in, in Maxime's. And Maxime's, uh, the building was originally uh, conceptualized as a hotel, but in the late 70s, it was converted to condos uh, and Maxime's closed in the early 80s. When I was there, it was actually after that sort of kept open and you could get in there. So with the students, we went, we peeked in there and we saw this sort of velvet Art Nouveau, uh, you know, craziness down there. And also what's crazy, you can imagine in the 1963, who was going through Waikiki and his Lincoln Continental, uh, remind us? That was President John F. Kennedy. And I also want to say, too, that the red velvet interior that you're looking at there is copied from the original Maxime's in Paris, which is a landmark of Art Nouveau interior decoration. So that's what that's referring to in its Chicago uh, appearance that you got to see. Exactly. So you had to go into the, the, the entrance to the restaurant was from the side, so to speak, although there isn't really a side, but the side street, not the main street, but the side street. And then it basically went down through this sort of, you know, very, you know, swoopy, sexy staircase there. And what was also down had to be all the parking. This is why I was alluding to 1963, where Kennedy came through and then unfortunately in that same car in Texas died got assassinated that same year that building was built and they had to get all these big lanyards down there. And it's crazy with a, with a radius of the ramp. And they actually did something that's unimaginable today. They actually extended the parking down to the, under the public street, like really crazy as to, you know, because the footprint of the building, you, know, you can barely fit three town cars or Lincoln Continentals, they were called back then, right? Yeah. So all very, very crazy. The restaurant, by the way, was run by Goldberg's wife, Nancy, and they were quite the celebrities to that uh, in town. And, um, and the building, again, uh, carries that legacy. Um, uh, the, uh, it was sold, uh, then it was donated, actually, by the Goldbergs to the city, and the city then uh, sold it to one of the tenants in the building who owns a, a condo there. And in here... He runs it. He continues it. I think that was one of the obligations of the city to keep it. But he, unfortunately, I say, unfortunately, it makes it now a private club. So it's not that public anymore. Right? But if you ever go there, get there, you should you should check it out and knock on the door and see if they <laughs> want, you won't miss it. And again, the same tragedy for both buildings, getting back to the building performance um, in the around the same time in the early 2000s or late 90s for a building here in 1996, as you can read, 
they took these uh, very multi-performative louvers in a bioclimatic, biokinetic way uh, away. And unfortunately, um, that's it. And now it's basically out there and exposed without any protection to not just uh, the harsh, hot summers that we have, but also the cold winters where we can assume the louvers, however they are, they must have been horizontal louvers and not vertical louvers because we can see this in the texture there. Okay. And did the, and did the, the people in those rooms get to control those louvers manually? That that's how you, I mean, the, the text, uh, Eric, you go back to the previous slide. That's the most you can find out there if you play detective work. Um, and that's how I get it from that text. And I guess that sort of randomness of the appearance that we see, I think that's an indication for people individually making choices, how they would operate them. And once again, they were saying, you know, they were rusting, and uh, but we're saying then replace them, right? When there's something like with your car, you have a 60s Corvette, you're right, you got to grease it, you got to sometimes replace it, but you want to keep it right, which they didn't. So yeah, and I also just want to say that the, the text that we just looked at points out something you can see in the photograph, which is it made the exterior of the building visually dynamic, because yeah. it was always changing. So it was yeah. not it was not static. And it also, yeah. as you can see, has a kind of a pattern or a checkerboard pattern that changes all the time as people change the orientation of the louver. So that adds something to the liveliness of the building's exterior. Absolutely. And that meaning, you know, it was literally and figuratively cool because it was bioclimatically, you know, biokinetic. So that was the cool thing. So for both owners, clients, bring these back. Next slide. Um, and so we also want to talk about performance of buildings. Okay, can one affordability is an increasing performance aspect for both cities, right? And and by the way, I'm uh, tonight I'm going to call finally Glasgow Han, who's the company who has evolutionized our jealousies into triple pane uh, passive house performance because I think that would be a way. You could, you, in the next sort of renovation interval, which buildings have anyways, I would suggest that for this building here, because then you got the horizontal louvers to begin with, which that product has. In the summer, you can just pop them open and get the breeze through, which again, in a corner unit is really, you know, which in the skinny tower, you had originally four units at the corner, just like our Waikiki townhouse that we see in the next slide. So we suggest that one. And I did some uh, detective work, and this is on the optimistic side because I always try to find the cheapest unit here, and that was the one I found for a roughly three hundred thousand dollars, one bedroom, one bathroom, a little bigger than in the Waikiki townhouse, but in the in the same range. So that's still pretty. When I was there, actually, I, a resident told me, "Oh, you can snap one of these units some while ago for two hundred thousand dollars, and now they're in the six hundreds, which probably some are, but here." I found one that's maybe it's down again or so. So that's kind of happy to see. And uh, Goldberg also uh, said this building was sort of like a test or a prototype for which we look at next Marina City, which he was building at the next time where he could let more out his rebellious nature of curvilinearness. But we also want to point out something really a bummer for because people say, don't buy a condo, buy a house because a house you can decide, you know, how much money you want to put into like fixing it. And your parents' house just had, because your mother passed away, you had to termite treat it when I was there and getting one of our PI mobiles out there that you kindly let there when I'm not there. And so you have, you, but you can decide when you want to do that, right? In, in, a, in a condo building, not because you have what you call the homeowners association and they collectively decide with you and for you. So there is this fee for all the upkeeping. And you see for this building, the HOA fee is 1100 bucks, right? And you add that to a mortgage, depending how much down payment you have, and then it's another story, then it is not that affordable anymore, right? You want to... Yes. And that's what you just pointed out. If you own your own home, you make all those own decisions, your, your decisions yourself as to what maintenance you want. But in a building like this, and I might also point out a, a suburb or a subdivision that has a homeowners association as well, you get told what you can and cannot do, and you are forced to pay every single month. Absolutely. 
So go to Marina City, next slide. There it is. There is a there's a slice of it, a pizza pie slice of it. <laughs> and we also have uh, my colleague Cara Seralta and her husband and colleague Brian Strawn both here now. They told uh, me once they used to own a unit and I did detective work on that one and found the information down there at the bottom. Here they are. And to the left is basically their unit. And this is a one bedroom as well. And it's made out of one and a half slices of that sort of rhythm of um, these uh, kind of, um, you know, again, little blossoms there. Uh, you know, it's alluded to by different people in different ways, corn cubs and whatever. And uh, and 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 um, uh, uh, Goldberg himself alluded it to a sunflower, I guess, with the seeds and the modularity. He wasn't just going for the look, but also for the performance in many ways. So it was very innovative and provocative at its time, because at that time it was like, oh, you don't live in the city, right? The city is just to work and then you go home to the burbs. So it was very sort of revolutionary and risky at the same time. And uh, and and here you can see Carla also recently because of you know non discrimination you're usually not supposed to ask you know about your uh, your private life but she recently shared uh, in public uh, that that they have no kids you know and so to live in that in a one bedroom and they yeah, really remodel it nicely with a Murphy bed you know coming down and you can already imagine. It's fairly nice. And I did, again, the low balling. I found one. And Dan, our patron for the show, shared with me the same thing, that a coworker of his also snapped the unit for fairly cheap. So I found one, a steal here for $180,000 only uh, of that size. Um, and also the HOAs are really cheap there. They're 550 bucks only. Um, if you rent, and this makes, you got to have some money, right? And maybe, you know, if you're just a couple, it's okay. And you both dinkies, then you make that money. But you got to have that money. Once you rent, it's another story again, because they start, you know, at, at about two grand, and they go up to three grand, right? And then uh, it's, it's a whole kind of a different uh, story about that. So we want to keep that in mind. Uh, increasingly, families are really in trouble, right? And and we tested this out ourselves here when the four of us were here in our 230 square feet uh, with, uh, you know, the adolescence uh, cave craving of our most junior, you know, that was challenging. And I only, you know, we had designed Primitiva 1 that way. And I hadn't done enough self-study myself at that point. So I look at it. I look back differently and I got to say it only works for certain people, right? And uh, the more on your own by yourself you are, the easier it is. The more people who you are, the more uh, challenging it gets, right? And I have to say, looking at that floor plan, that I find fascinating. I had absolutely no idea that those rounded protuberances, which are such a feature of this building, could be split in half for inhabitation. I yeah. assumed that it would all be you had one of those bumps or you had two of those bumps, but no, you can have one and a half. And yeah. I find that very innovative and fascinating, and I would never have thought that that would have been done. It is. And let's uh, get us talking innovative to the next and last slide, because only three minutes left, but let's sort of review what we talked about in the in the last show predominantly that while you know the just passed away Rafael Vignoli's tower in Manhattan is a super richy uh, $7,000 per square foot that breaks down. So that's like the super through the roof. Uh, Don Hibbert just addressed that in his class, rightly so. The students told me when we were doing uh, for the book, uh, they wanted to go through Waikiki and reassess certain buildings and retake some pictures. And one of the buildings that I had put on the list was the late, the later Joe Paul Rongstead before he deviated to the sort of invasive rubber stamped uh, hermetic skinny towers. He did this one, the, uh, the marina, also called marina. So there's a similarity. And that's on the other end of Waikiki. We see that at the bottom right and the, in the next to us on the beach on all one legs, because that's what this tower is doing there, right? And so um, that one actually has uh, four studios on each floor, and it has this backpack exterior fancy elevator that breaks down a lot. 
and that feeds into the high HOA fees, which is in the same uh, ball game of eleven hundred or so. I saw, but and then you can snap a unit for two hundred twenty thousand, you know, which is still, but you only get a small, and you don't have any lanai. And actually, the the orientation of these kind of slices, they're pushed back and facing west. So I propose to you guys to take it off the list because it might actually not match our criteria anymore and we replace it which we see at the bottom left which we introduced last week the Waikiki townhouse which is the units are going for one bedroom 330,000 in that kind of range the HOA fees are under a thousand uh, and they're actually, actually doing something smart they're uh, they're doing the metering in individually now in the units and not overall because overall it's like I can have my AC blasting like in my building and they put up signs in the elevator to make people more conscious. But, you know, unless you're forced, uh, which is sometimes the best encouragement, if, if, you're, if you're charged for what you basically consume, then you rethink it, right? And that's what's going to happen in, in, that, in that building there. Also, the, the new Raphael Vignoli up there at the top left, you know, is uh, uh, it's actually a rental, we have to say. We have to give him that uh, retrospectively for one show uh, uh, behind. And the, you know, the studio starts at 1700 or 2000. So it's pretty much the same range. So, I mean, New York, um, we got to do the, the overall assessment, but at least Vignoli in Chicago is way cheaper than Vignoli in, or at least comparing these two projects, right? So there's a certain similarity between Chicago and uh, that we have a housing crisis in both cities but it's mostly for families and for individually individuals and sort of double income dinkies. You know, it's it's maybe still kind of doable, uh, both on the rental side and the owner side. So that is it for today because we're out of time. We've got to continue with that to find out why in the world again are we importing these uh, same eye rises? But next week we're back to uh, the climatically similar city uh, east of this one here in Boston with our uh, guest, Matt Noblet, to see what we can learn from him, what he has done there for us here in Honolulu. So until then, stay, I guess, uh, what we got ourselves excited about today, bioclimatically biokinetic, biokinetically bioclimatic. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>